It was on the 12th of September 1973, here in the small sleepy village of Batewell, that a brutal crime took place in the nearby cemetery. A girl by the name of Wendy Sewell was found badly beaten and left for dead. Now, one man would end up being accused of the attack on Wendy, and when she passed away two days later, he would be charged with her murder. He would go on to spend the best part of 20 or 29 years in prison for a crime that he always said he never committed. This, my friends, is the story of Wendy Sewell. So it's here within the grounds of Bakewell Cemetery that on the 12th of September 1973 the attack on Wendy Sewell occurred and it occurred just over in that direction we're going to go to the location shortly. Now there was a young man by the name of Stephen Downing who was one of the groundsmen for the cemetery. He had returned to work after a couple of days off through illness. Now from all accounts I think he used to sit somewhere in the area where Wendy would be found by Stephen. Wendy Sewell herself, she had come into the grounds during her lunch break. I don't know if it's something that she'd do on a regular occasion, but on this day in particular, she made her way to Bakewell Cemetery and we don't know why. Like I said, she might have done it on a few times in the past, it might have been a routine, I honestly do not know. But on this day in particular, on the 12th of September, she indeed had made her way here into Bakewell Cemetery. Now Stephen himself would eventually come along this path just over there and he will come across Wendy's body lying on the floor. Now at the time when he found her it was obvious that she had been badly beaten. There was blood covering her clothing on her head. I think she was semi-naked at the time so some of her clothes were taken away. Um, I think they were thrown around the ground near to where her body lay. But Wendy herself was still alive, but barely. Now panicking, Stephen went over to her and from all accounts I think he tried to either comfort her or pick her up, but he certainly touched Wendy's body because his clothes would eventually be found with Wendy's blood on them. Now Stephen panicked and he went into town to go and get help and he would leave Wendy's body here where he found her. Now when he returned shortly after with help, Wendy herself had moved position only slightly away from where she was originally found. Now some people think if Wendy had been badly beaten the way she was she couldn't possibly have moved on her own. So the theory is if it wasn't Stephen Downing who had attacked her perhaps the culprit was indeed still lurking in Catcliffe Woods and this is why Stephen said he, he actually saw somebody running back into the woods when he came back to the cemetery. Nobody knows again for sure if Wendy's attacker maybe had come back to finish the job off or indeed Wendy herself had moved from where she was found. So Wendy Sewell, she was a secretary at the Forestry Commission here in Batewell and not far from where Stephen worked here at Batewell Cemetery. Now on the day, like I said, when the attack happened on the 12th of September, she'd left her office at around lunchtime and she walked up to the cemetery and apparently she was alone. But there was one witness who actually would come forward and say that they saw her coming into the cemetery gates further in that direction. Now Stephen Downing, he was having a cigarette outside the unconsecrated ground part of the cemetery, which incidentally is this area. So you've got the unconsecrated here and the consecrated further back. Now he noticed Wendy Sewell walking in the grounds and apparently he then collected his soft drinks bottle from a chapel, which I think is that one, guys. And then he headed out to a local shop. Now, which shop that is, I couldn't honestly tell you. Now, from the shop, he went to visit his mother, who lived nearby. And then he would return here, back at the cemetery, and back to work. And that is when he would come across the body of Wendy Sewell lying on a pathway just 
somewhere down here guys and like i said we're going to go to the location shortly when stephen arrived back here at the cemetery with the police and they found wendy's body again she was still alive i, I should add at this point the police quickly got an ambulance to arrive here and Wendy was taken to Chesterfield Royal Hospital. And the police would also then ask Stephen to accompany them to the local police station where he would be questioned on the events leading up to and after finding Wendy's body here. Now, it would quickly escalate and Stephen would become the number one prime suspect. Now where Vicky is now standing is where we believe Wendy's body would be found by Stephen Downing. So where Vicky is now stood, Wendy would have been somewhere around, around here. And we know this because of this headstone. And if I remember rightly, I think it's, uh, this is the final resting place of, is it Anthony or Anthony? Nailer, which is correct, which is it's very hard to see. So it's this headstone can identify where Wendy indeed would be found. And like I said, guys, it would have been round about here, somewhere Wendy would have been found. That is Catcliffe Woods where Stephen would tell police that he saw somebody disappearing back into, into the woods itself. I'm not sure how, how practical that will be because there is quite a drop just behind there. Um, I mean, it's feasible, but you can see just the incline itself. So for somebody to jump over and run down, whether or not it's these, these parts, we don't know. It may have been in that direction yep. where where, where, where the intruder went. Well, like Vicky's just uh, said, these houses along here, um, it, was a, it was a huge risk in attacking anybody just in this location here. Um, you have got the houses just a matter of yards away. Was it during the day? And it was during the day, um, it was lunchtime, and that is Burton Edge. I think that's Burton Edge Road. So it was a huge risk. Now, people have always said, what was Wendy doing coming here on her own at lunchtime? Again, was it a usual walk? Nobody's ever fully explained that and I've not come across anything to suggest that is what she did indeed do. Was this a one-off? Was she coming here to meet somebody? We'll get more into why I said that shortly, but it's quite practical or possible that she was making her way here indeed to meet somebody. And it was that person or persons who she was coming to meet who may well have attacked her. But like I said, we'll get into that shortly. Now, as for Wendy herself, when the police arrived at the scene, and like I said, they found a partially or semi-naked body, they also found a bloodied pickaxe handle, handle next to where a body was lying. Now, obviously, being bloodied, you would expect DNA perhaps, I'm not quite sure if DNA maybe at the time was available, I'd have to look that up but if you guys know down below I'm not quite sure about DNA and what year it was being used but certainly the pickaxe handle was covered in blood and so was Stephen's claws. Now Stephen would tell the police that the reason why he was covered in blood was because he went to help Wendy, he went to I think pick her up or sit her up and that's when he got the blood on his clothing which is plausible. Now because Stephen and his low IQ and the police got him to sign a confession saying that he had attacked Wendy that, that afternoon here in the cemetery, it would become extremely difficult for him to prove otherwise. Like I said, he'd tell the police that somebody tried to go into Catcliffe Woods, he'd disturb somebody. Wendy's body had been moved from where he had left her before he went to go and get police and then obviously when he came back she'd moved. 
the police I, I, it's, it's hard for me to find the words and the phrases but it seems the police were intent on putting all of the blame directly onto Stephen without I won't say fully investigating his claims but it seemed that because he had a low IQ and he was a 17 year old boy it, it, was, it was the easy suspect, it was the easy target to pin this on now like we said the attack took place here just after lunchtime around 10 to 1 on the 12th of September 1973. From all accounts, Wendy herself, herself had been sexually assaulted. Her bra was partially removed. Many of her undergarments had been taken away and taken off and scattered, like I said, close to her body. She'd been beaten around the head around seven times with this broken pickaxe handle. It was a brutal, it was a brutal attack on an innocent young woman. But why? Why was Wendy here and why was she attacked that day? Now, obviously, random attacks happen all the time. We've covered quite a few stories over the last 12 months, two years, and attacks do occasionally happen on random people. People said they're few and far between. But the more me and Vicky delve into these kind of stories, the more we don't really believe that. We believe that there is hundreds if not thousands of people out there both men and women and children capable of inflicting harm and damage on innocent people such as Wendy it may well have been a random attack but what I want to get to now guys may become across a bit conspiracy but it does seem from all accounts that Wendy was a bit promiscuous here in Bakewell Some of these men, from all accounts, were quite influential, influential throughout the area of Bakewell. Some may have been wealthy, I'm not quite sure. Some may have been quite high up in, in, in council properties, buildings, whatever, I'm not sure. But from all accounts, we've seen quite a few people here in Bakewell. And now it's been written, and it's been said by many people, and I think it's in a book written by Don Hale. Now, Don Hale was a journalist here in Bakewell and he looked into the case of Stephen Downing on request from Stephen's parents. Now Don Hale uncovered or he would say he would uncover a big conspiracy here in Bakewell and that Wendy had been attacked by somebody because she was about to spill the beans on a relationship that she'd had with like I said somebody quite influential here in Bakewell. Now whether or not that is true we don't know fully, we can't be sure. But it, again, it does seem plausible. Like I said, from all accounts, Wendy was quite promiscuous and she was seeing quite a lot of people. So it only needed one slip of the tongue to the wrong person and it might have unraveled a tale and a weave of deceit and lies which could have affected these more influential people. When Stephen was being questioned by the police, at one stage, I think there was over nine hours of talks that went on. Now, we have to bear in mind, like I said, in the cemetery that Stephen had a very low IQ and he apparently had a reading age of an 11 year old. So you, you can understand Stephen and his mentality at the time. He pretty much, he may well have agreed to almost anything thinking he was doing the right thing. We don't know, only Stephen himself probably can answer that now. Now Stephen would eventually be charged with the murder of Wendy Sewell. Like I said, she would pass away two days after being found lying in the cemetery. So obviously it had gone from an attack, a, ch a charge of an attack on a, on a woman to one of murder. And like I said, Stephen would end up being charged. Now his trial would take place between 13th and 15th of February 1974 at the Crown Court over in Nottingham. Now although he would admit to sexually assaulting Sewell as she lay in the cemetery and several witnesses 
uh, and forensic scientists, they would indeed, well, when I say confirm, but they would imply that the, the, the blood splatters on Stephen's clothing would match up to somebody who had committed such an attack on Wendy. Stephen himself would backtrack on his admission and say in the end he never did it and he was only basically telling the police what they wanted to hear and he thought, like I said, he was doing the right thing. Now as we look up to roughly where when his body was found in the cemetery, you can see what I mean about the, the drop and the incline down here. So whether or not Stephen was just making this story up of seeing somebody run into the woods, it's hard to imagine somebody doing that because it is, like I said, it's quite a steep hill. Now there is a footpath around the back which me and Vicky's just walked round just to get a feel for the place. But indeed it is quite a hefty drop. So I think this is why the police didn't believe Stephen's uh, story. I could well be wrong. But it is highly unlikely somebody did indeed jump over near where Wendy would have been found roughly above there. Now we've just been reading up some notes that I've got written down and I missed this fact out. But while Stephen was in court, he said he only confessed because he thought that Wendy had not been seriously injured and that she wouldn't die. Now it was a strange thing to do when all said and done and considering the ramifications but again, he had an IQ, a low IQ in the reading age of an 11 year old. So I presume it was just, it was just scared, he was panicked. Now, after all witnesses had come forward and the trial was coming to an end, after just one hour of deliberations, a unanimous verdict came through and the jury would found Stephen Downing guilty of murder and he would be sentenced indefinitely are sentenced to be detained def indefinitely at Her Majesty's pleasure. And the stipulation would be that he should serve at least 17 years in prison. Now after serving almost 27 years incarcerated in prison for a crime that Stephen was adamant he never committed and as a result of Donnell's investigation and campaign to free the innocent man the case itself it would be referred to Criminal Cases Review Commission in 1997 so like we said Stephen himself would be released I think it was sometime in 2001 upon appeal now the following year, the Court of Appeal overturned Stephen's conviction and he, well, the appeal itself found that the confession and evidence, it was all unreliable. Now a second appeal took place on the 15th of January 2002 and the Court of Appeal accepted a whole range of reasons that were put forward by Don Hale and others who believed that the conviction itself, the original conviction itself, was all-heartedly wrong. Now, one of the one of the first things that the Court of Appeal looked into was that of Downing's confession. And it it was deemed unsafe, I think that's the word they use, it was an unsafe confession, because Downing himself had been questioned for around eight or nine hours. The police apparently had kept Stephen awake for most of that time. They would shake him to wake him up. They would keep pulling his hair. It was also, it was never formally cautioned um, in what he would say would be used in evidence, you know, obviously against him. And because he wasn't given a solicitor at the time, obviously, Everything he said was under duress 
and he had no solicitor, no barrister to stop any questioning or to question the police's motives in the questioning back in 1973. So this is the entrance where Wendy Sewell would have made this short trip from where she worked and into Bakewell Cemetery. And this section is the consecrated side. And the area where she would be attacked is the unconsecrated, which is just past this chapel. There's a second chapel further back. Now the pickaxe angle itself, Don Hale would find out that it had been on display at Derby Museum. So he organized for the handle to be tested forensically for obviously blood, I presume DNA, fingerprints maybe. Now whilst it never contained any single fingerprints, it did contain a palm print, the palm print of somebody unidentified. Now obviously this palm print couldn't be used as any evidence because so many people would have held that pickaxe handle at some point from being discovered here at the cemetery and being put on display at the museum. But yeah, certainly there was a, a palm print of an unidentified person found upon that handle. Now, one of the other parts of the appeal would revolve around the blood splatterings found on Downing's clothing. And even though the prosecution was successful at the time in proving or thinking they were right in proving that Stephen had committed the attack on Wendy because of the blood splatterings on his clothing and the forensic people said it was consistent with that of somebody who would perform such a brutal attack on another person. The court would also argue and would be successful, the jury would, would, would look into this and the evidence which supported that the blood splatterings themselves could also have been apparent and could have occurred with that of somebody helping somebody off the floor who had been battered, such as Wendy Sewell. So even though he had blood on his clothing, it didn't necessarily mean he had committed the offence on Wendy Sewell. Lord Justice Pill said that the Court of Appeal, they didn't have to consider whether Downing had proved that he was innocent, but whether the original conviction was fair enough. Uh, we're going to read from Wikipedia but it was said that the question for the Court of Appeals consideration is whether the conviction is safe and not whether the accused is guilty. So what the defence had proved was that there was reasonable doubt about the reliability of the confessions made back in 1973. And his Lordship would say that the court cannot be sure the confessions are reliable. It follows that the conviction is unsafe and the conviction is quashed. So after Stephen Downing was released from prison and in the eyes of the law free man, questions would still remain over his guilt or his innocence. He always maintained that he never attacked Wendy Sewell here, which would therefore lead to her death. But he did admit out of court and out of the police's eyes to other people that he did indeed attack Wendy. And I think it was either a hidden microphone or there was something which was picked up which basically he admitted that he had attacked Wendy. There's also stories which have emerged which point him to the scene of the crime, not necessarily committing the attack on Wendy, but attacking her whilst she was semi-conscious, lying on the floor further back in that direction. Again, none of this could be used as reliable information. Now the question you guys have to ask yourselves, I guess, is, is Stephen Downing guilty of the attack and murder of Wendy Sewell. In the eyes of the law, he is an innocent man. He served 27 years incarcerated in several prisons, youth prisons and obviously adult prisons. Now if he is an innocent man, he has served 27 years behind bars. Pretty much his life wasted behind bars for something he didn't do. However, if that is the case, then the question therefore lies, who is guilty of the murder of Wendy Sewell? Somebody out there, either in Bakewell or further afield, knows more to this story than what meets the eye. If Stephen was in fact guilty, you could argue and say he has served his time in prison, but then again is walking free amongst the people of Bakewell, is that justice for Wendy Sewell? if you have committed such an horrific act. 
Let me know down below, guys, what you think of this case and if you believe Stephen Downing is innocent or guilty of the attack and murder on Wendy Sewell. Now, it's whilst here in Bakewell that me and Vicky stopped to talk to one of the local residents and we asked if they've lived here for most of their life and if they knew, obviously, the case and the story of Wendy and Stephen. Now, they said, and I'm not going to say if it's a he or she, but they said that they have lived here, like I said, most of the time and they were indeed here at the time of the murder. Now, we also asked if Stephen Downing himself still lived in Bakewell and they confirmed that he surely does. So Stephen still lives here, like I said, in Bakewell. We didn't push too much on the questioning regarding Stephen because, like Vicky said, we, we kind of picked up a vibe that this, this person didn't really want to get too much into it, which is, which is fine because they did actually say to us that feelings are still high, emotions are still high, feelings are still high, raw over this case. Some seem to be acceptable or okay with Stephen living back here in Bakewell, but from the vibe we picked up, it seems that some residents aren't too happy, let's put it that way, that Stephen has relocated back to where he grew up and obviously where this crime was committed. But like I said, we didn't want to push this person too much on it. You know, we've, we, we've got some some levels of questions that, that we do and that we won't do. And like I said, we picked up the feeling that even though this person was approachable and very friendly and kind and answered some questions, you could also tell there was some kind of some kind of vibe there, so we didn't want to push it too much. But by all accounts, Stephen Downing still lives here in Bakewell and it's 50-50 whether or not the residents kind of accept it or don't accept it. But uh, yeah, we're here guys, we're here in Bakewell covering the story of Wendy Sewell and that of obviously Stephen Downing. Tell us your thoughts down below on this case. Now as we leave Bakewell Cemetery and Bakewell itself, it's been an interesting case this one. There's a lot more to this tale, and like I said, if you read Don Hale's book, and I'll put links down below, you'll find it extremely interesting. Whether or not Don Hale has fabricated some elements of his story and not his book, because like I said, some of it does seem quite dramatic, especially in the first few paragraphs. It's more akin to what you see in, a, in an action film. Um, but please, by all means, click the link, order the book, and read it for yourselves. Make your own mind up on whether Stephen Downing is in fact guilty of the attack and murder on Wendy Sewell. Comment down below your thoughts on this one, guys. Like I said earlier, if Stephen is innocent of this crime, then an innocent man has spent much of his life incarcerated behind bars. If he's guilty, could you argue and say, well, at least he has served his time in prison? Is serving 27 years long enough for the murder of another person? Comment down below. But in the meantime, guys, as I always say, from this nice, beautiful location here in Batewell and this brilliant, warm weather, we want you to take care, look after yourselves, and me and Vicky will be back soon with another tale from a dark, but at times, glorious past. Take care, guys.